arrive. I'm still a couple of minutes early, but we'll get underway. So, um, those who don't know me, my name's Martin. This is Jenny Wang. She was a PhD student in the Cardiac Mechanics Group. Uh, Jenny did a, a biomedical engineering here, degree here at the University of Auckland from 2010 to 2013. I think I've got those dates right. And during that time, she did a couple of summer studentships. I think she did one with Gib Bogle on agent-based modelling, and then another one with Vinod Suresh on cellular signalling and maybe Salamel programming. Um, and then stayed on, did a part four project, and now a PhD in cardiac mechanics. So she's going to tell you all about her PhD, but just a couple of other things about Jenny in terms of her career to date. She's uh, represented our group at a number of conferences, so I think there are something like seven different conference abstracts. I had to check out and see if <laughs> stuff down. A couple of conference papers, and she's got two journal papers under review at the moment. Well, close to two. We're about to submit the second one now. Uh, she's an award-winning presenter, so we're going to hear her oh, presentation yeah. skills today. I no think pressure. you've got four presentation oh. prizes at different <laughs> meetings and finalist in a couple of other categories. So Never longer than 10 minutes, though. So. <laughs> That's right, three-minute pieces. <laughs> yep. And the other thing that you may not know about Jenny is that she's a performance-level violinist as well. So I think from 2010 to 2013, during your undergraduate degree, you were in the uh, Auckland Youth Orchestra. <laughs> and I think your CV says something like, I've played loads of gigs <laughs> <laughs> around or something like that. And you continue to play gigs, um, as far as I understand, uh, many Sundays or maybe on the weekends yeah, at church. Or sometimes. Singing and playing violin and, and yep. uh, enjoying yourself and performing very well in that sort of sense as well. So <laughs> Jenny's um, about to leave our shores. So this, this is a, a Auckland Bioengineering Institute PhD, PhD exit seminar although Jenny has not actually had her oral examination yet, so it's a little premature, but Jenny's about to leave our shores this Friday evening, uh, or actually Saturday morning at like 1am or something, to head off to Oxford University to take up a postdoctoral research fellowship in the computing lab with some collaborators of ours uh, working on uh, cardiac electrophysiology. So these are people we know quite well, but it's going to be quite a change of pace for Jenny, moving away from some of the stuff that you've heard about here at least it's the heart still, so that's all we're relevant. So we're going to look <laughs> yeah. forward to hearing about what you have to say about heart failure. Thank okay. You. Thank you for that introduction, Martin. It was much longer than I expected <laughs> and much more personal. Um, okay. Cool. Well, welcome to this talk. Thank you for all showing up. Lots of faces I don't know. Um, so my thesis was on left ventricular mechanics and human heart failure, so I'm going to go straight into it. Um, so first of all, some preamble about heart anatomy and function. So I'm sure a lot of you know this already. Uh, what I'm really interested in is the left ventricle here and the pressure and volume performance that it has, which is shown here. So the cardiac cycle can basically be divided up into two sections, two phases. The systolic phase, in which the heart contracts to pump out blood, uh, it ejects blood and the diastolic phase in which the heart fills. And there is a very important uh, point in the diastolic phase which is called diastasis or DS, at which point the heart has minimum pressure and so we often take this point to be the sort of load free and reference geometry of the heart. So more on that later. So this is the heart. Uh, so uh, the left ventricle is the main pumping chamber and the pressure volume relationship is indicative of performance. Uh, and very briefly in the microstructural organization of the heart as well. So the cardiac tissue is actually organized into sheets of myocyte fibers where the orientation of the myocyte fiber varies from the endocardium to the epicardium. So uh, here's the endocardium, here's the epicardium, and you can see it uh, in this little picture here. So it means that we can sometimes think of the heart as having three uh, different uh, mechanical properties in three different directions. Uh, the sheet, the fiber, and the sheet direction, which is perpendicular to the fiber direction, but in the sheet plane, and the sheet normal direction. So my PhD was more, uh, was more focused on looking at what happens to the heart when it fails. So here are some heart failure characteristics that clinicians are used to thinking about. So they're used to, they're used to thinking about it in terms of epidemiology, uh, in terms of the hemodi hemodynamic dysfunctions, which presents in symptoms like chest pain and uh, uh, dyspnea. And uh, they're used to thinking of it, of it in terms of geometric remodeling, so the shape of the heart changes. So you can see here, uh, this is a type of heart failure called, heart, uh, called dilated cardiomyopathy. And this kind of 
uh, re uh, remodeling is often seen in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction, I'll quickly explain, is basically the fraction of the ejected volume of blood uh, over the volume of blood that enters the heart during diastolic filling. And so the other kind of phenotype that we see is the sort of hypertrophic heart where the walls are much thicker and this is often present in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So what is sometimes missing in the clinical understanding is what, ha what is happening at the tissue property level of the heart. So uh, for example, if they, because they're grouping heart failure into uh, preserved and reduced ejection fraction, they're finding that a lot of the treatments which are effective for this type of heart failure is not effective for that type of heart failure. So this is a very uh, urgent problem because this type of heart failure is also growing with the aging population. So um, there are two important clinical markers of heart failure that we'll be looking at. Uh, so the first one is to do with the pressure volume function of the heart. So this is a, a global uh, measure of, it's a measure of the global function of the heart. So you can look at the end diastolic pressure volume relationship to get a measure of the global stiffness of the chamber, or you can look at the end systolic pressure volume relationship to get a, a measure of the contractility of the heart. So this is something that is routinely done in the clinical uh, environment. Uh, the other thing that clinicians can look for is hormones in the blood, such as this brain natriuretic uh, peptide BMP and its related molecule, which is called N-terminal prohormone of BMP, and they are thought to reflect elevated wall stretch or stress, although it is unclear which exactly it is. They just seem to find correlations of this with um, heart failure, basically. So just to recap, um, so the clinical understanding of heart failure uh, tends to group these things into a dichotomy, so reduced ejection, uh, ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction, or they tend to think of in a more clinical sense of symptoms, so the severity of symptoms they can classify heart failure into four classes, or perhaps they tend to think, think of it in terms of dysfunctions in different phases of the cardiac cycle, in the diastolic phase, problems with filling, or the systolic phase, problems with, with contraction. Um, but what is missing is, and what they need, is some sort of indication or uh, classification using this intrinsic myocardial property instead of these other uh, more global and symptomatic based classification tools. And so we're hoping that this intrinsic myocardial properties that we're able to estimate is going to provide a new dimension for patient evaluation and heart failure. So this is where biomechanical uh, modeling comes in. So uh, this is sort of the structure of, of, of how we do things. We are integrating uh, all these different factors which influence ventric uh, ventricular function and dysfunction into a physically consistent vinyl element model. So this includes the hemodynamics, so the pressure loading of the heart, uh, the mechanical properties of the heart, in both in terms of passive and active, and the microstructure, which we talked about before, and the anatomy. And we're usually trying to match it to some sort of motion that we observe in our subjects in order to extract some sort of me mechanical properties from the tissue. So here are the main aims of my thesis. Didn't go for time. Um, so first of all, I looked at developing a pre-existing parameter estimation framework and focusing more specifically on identification, uh, or quantification of the identifiability of the parameters. And then uh, we were fortunate to have access to a set of clinical data set of human heart failure patients. So there was a, a, a large portion of my thesis which was dedicated to processing this data and making it available for use in biomechanical analysis. And then we applied this mechanical estimation framework to the data that we processed before to quantify stiffness and contractile properties of the heart and we did some group comparison statistics and uh, some clinical applications of that and then finally I looked at a novel method for estimating the load free geometry of the heart which we'll get into later. Cool. So first of all, um, this portion of my thesis was about developing the parameter estimation framework, about learning things about this framework and how to improve it. So this was done as part of a uh, left ventricular mechanics challenge in 2014 as part of the Mikai conference. And so this challenge was basically wanting to compare mechanical simulations between different methodologies and softwares across a variety of international groups. And so they provided us they provided us with um, a set of surface data points at diastasis, at end diastole and end systole. 
and also uh, pressure measurements at those time points as well as uh, specific subject specific muscle fiber orientation which is quantified using the first eigenvector of ex vivo diffusion tensor MRI so I won't go very far into uh, explaining what DTI is um, that is other people's PhDs down the road uh, down the end of the hall so uh, using this data, we were able to learn uh, two broad things about this parameter estimation framework we're working with. So the first thing we looked at was what is the effect of um, using this, what is the effect of using a, a good fiber orientation field on the mechanical simulation of the heart? So what we did was we fitted these DTI-derived fiber fields to each, so there were four canine geometries to each of the four canine geometries. And we also embedded some sheet orientation data from the Auckland dog heart model. This is so that we could represent the heart as an orthotropic material. And uh, we were able to generate these two sets of um, models. So the first set has a diffusion tensor fiber combined with sheet orientation from the Auckland dog heart. And the second set had the Auckland dog heart uh, fiber uh, combined. So, so it is the consistent Auckland dog heart. Uh, microstructure field. So we compared the two, these two types of fiber fields essentially uh, and looked at the effect it had on the systolic mechanics. So you can see that the DTI fiber field has a much lower transmural gradient of change of the myofiber orientation uh, than the ADH fiber field. And so we think that this is what, what is causing this lack of systolic shortening, which we expect to see but don't see in the mechanical simulations. So this was the first lesson that we learned from um, the set of studies and so because of that from uh, for the following studies we've decided in the absence of patient specific microstructure we've decided to use this Auckland dark hard fiber uh, microstructure instead. The other thing was we looked at the orthotropic material properties and uh, we looked at parameterizing that using the data that we have. So this is the hose up for Ogden orthotropic constitutive model. This was actually modified because we took away the isotropic term in order to decouple the axial term so that we had more control over the orthotropy of the material. Um, and because this, this constitutive model has eight different parameters and we were only able to fit to a set of surface data so there was no uh, material point displacement tracking, we decided that we would group these parameters into uh, three scaling parameters, MF, MS, and MN, and we took these A and B coefficients from a previous study which was fitted to experimental data, and we also were estimating the contractile pro uh, parameter at the front of the steady state active tension model here. So we actually performed a whole range of different uh, parameter estimation methods, including uh, separating out, estimating one passive parameter or two or three. Uh, and then we also looked at simultaneously estimating both the passive and the active parameters together by combining um, the objective functions for both. So I'm just going to quickly go over the parameter estimation method. So this is going to come up also in later parts of my thesis. So what we do is we begin with a reference geometry. Uh, which for the moment we assume is the diastasis geometry, and we take an estimate of the passive and active uh, parameters of the constitutive model, and using personalized pressure data, we can simulate a series of model predictions of inflation and contraction, and then we can compare these model predictions with what we see in the actual data, in the surface data, and use that error, by minimizing that error, we can then tune these passive and active parameters uh, to extract these estimates. So this is what we did uh, in the simultaneous uh, estimation of both the passive and the active parameters. Uh, and then, because we had multiple parameters, we wanted to look at what is the identifiability of these two parameters, of, of these uh, passive and active parameters, and how were they correlated. So this is when we looked into the Hessian matrix. So it is a square matrix of the second order of partial derivatives of the objective function. So basically from here we can see uh, a, uh, an, ind an index of the identifiability of the parameters and also the correlation between the parameters or value closer to one indicates low interaction. So I'll quickly show you the results. 
uh, what we saw was that, first of all, there was a correlation between the passive and the active parameters when they were simultaneously estimated, as you can see from the M optimality numbers, and that the identifiability of the parameters were decreasing with increasing parameters in the estimation. So in the end, um, I'm not showing all the results here, but in the end we decided that because we, were ha we only had surface data, it was unable to support the estimation of multiple passive parameters. And so this was also the reason why uh, that motivated us to go back to a simpler constitutive model as well. So uh, following this study, we actually went to a transversely isotropic uh, constitutive model instead of an orthotropic one. So just quickly, the conclusions of this section, uh, we saw that we needed a high transmural gradient of fiber orientation in order to have realistic systolic simulations, and that the identifiability of the passive parameters is low for the orthotropic constitutive model, and so we were looking for a simpler one to go ahead with. So, um, so this section is about processing the clinical data that we have from the St. Francis Hospital in New York. So, um, we had 28 different patients, uh, which were selected from a larger group in three different interest groups. So these are the clinical criteria that we criteria that we used to classify them. Uh, and to note here that it was that we excluded any severe myocardial infarction cases because we were looking at global stiffness parameters instead of regional. Uh, so we went through a process of image segmentation uh, using the cardiac image modeler and guide point modeling. So this is semi-automatic. And uh, we saw that we had four different types of catheter pressure measurements from this clinical data set. So we had the electrical cardiogram and a aortic pressure trace, as well as a pulmonary wedge pressure trace, which we took to be a surrogate for the left atrial pressure and also the left ventricular pressure. So we were interested in registering this pressure data with the images that we had because they were not acquired simultaneously. And in order to do that, we wanted to find five different cardiac, uh, important cardiac landmark points throughout the cardiac cycle in both the pressure and the images to be able to align the two together. Uh, and so I won't go into the details of this, but basically we used all of the traces in the previous slide to identify these five landmark points. And we also identified them in the MRI images by looking at mitral and aortic valve motion uh, to identify the same five landmark points. And so using these points, we were able to scale the um, temporarily scale the ventricular pressure trace uh, in a piecewise linear fashion between these five landmark points and so that we can have a mean pressure value at each of the MRI frames. So this was then important for our mechanical simulations later because we needed uh, patient-specific pressure values at every single MRI frame. And so also uh, we were able to produce this pressure volume relationship because we now had pressure estimations at every single uh, MRI frame and so we had, uh, we had registered pressure and volume values. And so from this we can see, uh, we can extract the passive pressure volume curve and fit a series of a mono-exponential or a linear curve to this in order to extract a clinical chamber stiffness constant. Uh, which we use for later analysis. And we found, uh, just to show you here, that there was no statistical difference between uh, the three groups in terms of their chamber stiffnesses, no matter what kind of interpolation we used and estimation uh, method that we used. Uh, so segmentation, and the important thing here is that we had temporal alignment between the pressure and the images. So, using the pressure and the image data that we have now aligned, we were then able to estimate uh, uh, the stiffness and co uh, contractile properties of the heart using for these human heart failure patients and also control. And so the reason why we wanted to do this was we wanted to show the clinicians that their measurement of the pressure volume uh, gradient was not specific to the tissue properties of the heart. So you can kind of see here that simply by increasing the size of the heart, you, there is a softening effect on the functional, uh, on the pressure volume function of the heart, and it has a similar effect to decreasing the myocardial stiffness. So theoretically, you can have two people with very similar pressure volume gradients, but very different diastolic myocardial stiffnesses. So uh, what we did here was, I talked about this before, we were using a transversely isotropic constitutive equation, and we were only estimating a single bulk stiffness parameter because we we're fitting the surface data. 
uh, and we used uh, these parameters from a previous study and also the same active contraction uh, model as before. You've seen this slide before, this is the parameter estimation framework that we used previously. And so we were able to estimate the diastolic myocardial stiffness for the 25, 28 different patients. So we saw that the control had a mean of 1.2, and the HIF-REF group had a mean of 6.4, and that the HIF-PIF group was somewhere in between, although there was no statistical difference between the HIF-PIF and the control groups. And uh, we also estimated the end diastolic ventricular stress by uh, averaging over the stresses evaluated at these Gauss points. And we found that there was a difference between the end diastolic stress of the hef ref group and the control group, but there was no difference between the hef pef and the control. And actually, uh, the spread of the data for the hef pef was very wide ranging, which was consistent, I think, with the understanding of the HEF-PEF group as a mixed bag of phenotypes and heart failure. Uh, we also looked at the correlation of, these, uh, of the stiffness and also of the chamber stiffness and the diastolic myocardial stiffness as well as the myofibrous stress with blood plasma measurements of nt pro bmp which we talked about before. So um, we found that, this, uh, that our diastolic myocardial stiffness estimation was uh, much better correlated with this blood plasma biomarker than the chamber stiffness estimates from pressure volume curves. Um, then the other thing that we wanted to look at was how, how much confidence could we have in the stiffness estimation uh, in order for it to, to be applicable to a clinical environment. So uh, one thing that we realized was that there is an inherent limitation in the model because because of the nonlinearity of the constitutive equation, the higher the stiffness of, of the model, the lower the amount of change in the deformation there was. And so theoretically, there would come a point where the change in stiffness is not able to produce a deformation which you can actually perceive in the images. And so when the heart is that stiff, you, you are essentially unable to identify what the stiffness value actually is. And so we needed to, some method <laughs> of finding out where that threshold value lay beyond which you cannot identify the stiffness. And so we wanted to, uh, we, we decided to use the objective function, the projection from the surface data to our model predictions as a surrogate measurement for the amount of deformation that's in the data. So um, at some really high stiffness value, we assume that the objective function is going to plateau off. And from this plateau value, we can add some sort of segmentation resolution, which we call alpha, in order to find a uh, error value beyond, a, a stiffness value beyond which we cannot actually identify the stiffness of the heart. So we did this for um, the 28 studies, and for some of them, we found that the optimized stiffness is identifiable because the uh, minimum stiffness parameter is below the threshold point, and for some of them it was not identifiable because the optimized stiffness value lay beyond the threshold point. So if we were to use uh, these stiffness, these threshold values instead of the optimized values, uh, when it lies below the optimized values, then we can update our results, our stiffness results, so that it looks like this. So we're happy to find that even when we have included this identifiability threshold, we're still seeing these group statistics differences between HIF-REF and control and also HIF-REF and HIF-PIF. Uh, the other thing that we're able to do is to estimate the contractile properties of the heart at uh, various um, frames from the end diastolic point back to the diastasis point. And so we were able to generate these transients of, of uh, the active tension parameter, which we evaluate and estimate at every single one of these frames. And we found that the maximum TCA, so that the maximum values of these, uh, of these transients were not significantly different between any of the gr three groups. However, we did find that the minimum extension ratio uh, in the heart was different between um, the HIF-REF and the control groups, and also the HIF-PIF and HIF-REF groups, and that it was also correlated with the nt pro bmp measurement, which we said before was related to wall stretch and wall stress. And so to quickly to summarize, uh, we were able to estimate diastolic mechanical myocardial stiffnesses by matching to CINI MRI, 
and we looked at the identifiability threshold of the stiffness in order to improve the group comparisons and we saw that the hif ref group had a higher stiffness than the control and that the hif pif stiffness was not significantly different from control and uh, we were able to estimate the contractile transient and that we saw that the minimum extension ratio was found to be able to distinguish between the control and hif ref and was correlated with the anti pro BMP measurements. So moving on from here, uh, one of the problems that we wanted to tackle was this, the use of the diastasis model as a reference geometry. Because for the heart failure cases that we've seen, there are a lot of models where the diastasis pressure is actually a lot higher than zero. So you have some which are in the range of one or two kilopascals. And so our assumption of the reference model being uh, the diastasis geometry is, becomes less valid when we're looking at more severely heart failure cases. And so uh, this is just a little proof of concept. So you can see here that by offsetting the pressure or by treating the diastasis model as the load-free geometry, uh, we actually have to increase the stiffness of the heart in order to match the same pressure volume gradient. And so this causes, this means that um, we have potentially overestimated our stiffnesses uh, because we are assuming a diastasis volume, uh, geometry which is not uh, the actual diastasis geometry. So what we're interested in doing is to actually estimate this, this true load-free geometry uh, from our clinical data in order to improve our estimates of stiffness and also contractility further down the line. So the way we thought about doing this was to um, estimate the load-free geometry and also the constitutive parameters simultaneously. And the only way, uh, and the way that we could think of in order to do this, because the load-free geometry is, is uh, described by 960 degrees of freedom, was to build in a dimension reduction step to the parameter estimation framework. So this is where the principal component analysis comes in, uh, where we can reduce the number of parameters that we need to represent this low-free geometry to just a handful, uh, so that we can more tractably estimate the weights as well as the constitutive parameters together by matching to the deformed geometries. So here is a quick summary of what a principal component analysis is. It is um, basically trying to tell us, uh, it is going to give us the principal components of variation in the data matrix that we have. And the way that we constructed this principal component analysis is by looking at the difference vector between the diastasis geometry and the load-free geometry. So using this difference vector, we were able to com construct the data matrix, look at the covariance of the data matrix, and evaluate the principal components. And we can evaluate the weights by projecting any difference vector to these principal components. And we can reconstruct any difference vector by using a handful of uh, principal components and a linear combination of them together. So there are actually a few different ways of constructing this data matrix. So the reason why we're using this uh, displace this, this difference vector instead of just the low-free geometry itself is so that we can um, get over, so that we can eliminate the difference in the sizes of the ventricles in our PCA so that we don't have to deal with that as well. So uh, we looked at three different ways of constructing the data matrix, but I'm only presenting two here. So the first way was if we actually had the true low-free geometry, then we would evaluate the difference vector between the diastasis and the low-free geometry and construct the data matrix using that. But this is not viable. Uh, we can't actually do this for the real data because we don't have this low-free geometry. So the other method we looked at was to unload the diastasis model using a range of stiffnesses from 1, 3, 5 to 10 kilopascals, which we uh, assume is going to range, uh, is going to span the range of stiffnesses that we are going to expect from the data that we see, uh, so that the low-free geometry is somewhere within this range, and we're using this to construct the principal component. So the reason why we're using this is so that we can be sure or m more confident that the principal components that we construct is able to represent this low-free geometry with a reasonable degree of accuracy. So in order to do this, we uh, needed to, first of all, perform a few feasibility studies. So we generated some synthetic data um, where we treated the diastasis geometries from the clinical data set before 
as our synthetic true load-free geometries, and we inflated them using a range of different pressure values, using, of course, non, uh, non-zero diastasis pressures, and we generated surface data from these inflated synthetic models. And uh, just, just as a uh, sanity check, we also looked at the projection error when our um, stiffness is very, very high from, diasta- from end diastole to diastasis. So this is, uh, in some ways, a measure of the amount of deformation there is in uh, diastole. And so we constructed the true PCAs I told you about before, and we found that the first principal component was able to account for 84.5% of the total variance, and we optimized for the first weight by matching to the synthetic surface data, so using the parameter estimation framework that I showed you in here. And uh, when we were doing this, we did it in two different ways. So the first way we did it was when we set, when we were estimating the first weight while setting all the other weights at the projected value. So remember, because this is the true PCA, we should be able to uh, accurately reconstruct the load-free geometry if we kept all of the principal components uh, in the analysis. So this one was able to give us a load-free geometry error of 10 to the minus 14. So we're happy that this is working out. And then the second thing that we, were, we looked at was what if we set all of the other ways to zero. So we threw away all the principal components apart from the first one, and sure enough, uh, there was a much higher error in the low-free geometry that we estimated. Then we looked at, uh, can we actually do this, uh, estimate the low-free geometry as well as the stiffness simultaneously? (coughs) So um, we added the stiffness parameter to the estimation, and we saw that the optimized low-free geometry error was quite low. Uh, but that there was a high eccentricity in the Hessian matrix, which was showing us that the objective function was much more sensitive to changes in the stiffness parameter than it was to changes in the geometric weight parameter. However, we were still able to uh, reconstruct the low three geometry uh, using this optimization framework. So then we applied a similar framework to the un- using the unloaded PCA instead. And so just to remind you, this was generated using a grid of stiffness values. Uh, and the first principal component was able to account for 79.8%, which is lower than previous. And so in the same way, we optimized for the first weight by matching to the synthetic surface data. And we set the initial guess for the weights to the known synthetic le- uh, left ventricular geometry weights. So again, we are expecting to see a reasonably good representation of the low free geometry, but there should be some error because of uh, our PCA did not actually in- include low free geometry when it was generated. And so this is the error that we saw when we kept all the other weights at the projected value. And when we threw away the other weights, this uh, value went up. So at this point, we were thinking about how this is going to be applied to a real clinical data where you don't actually know what the remaining weights uh, of this PCA should be. And so we took, um, in order to get a a smaller load-free geometry error, we took the unloaded geometry, which is computed using an arbitrary value, a mid-range value of three kilopascals, and we used those weights, uh, and we fixed the, uh, all the weights apart from the first one to the weights which are generated from projecting this model to the PCA. And so by doing that, when we estimate the first weight, we're able to get down to a lower low-free geometry error. And so in a similar way, we added the stiffness to this estimation framework, uh, and we were able to see a reasonably low C1 uh, error if we kept all of the weights from the actual true low-free geometry projection, and a small low-free geometry error as well. So here is, again, the high eccentricity, which we saw before with the true PCA. Uh, and when we use the three kilopascal unloaded geometry, we saw a slightly larger C1 error and also a much larger low free geometry error. So at this point, we went ahead to apply this uh, method to our clinical data. So first of all, we unloaded the diastasis models from the clinical data set using a grid of different stiffness values, and we found the principal components uh, using this. And we found that the first component accounted for 91.1% of the total variance. And we evaluated 
so the difference vector from the unloaded geometry using the three kilopascal unloading was projected to the principal components we evaluated. And uh, all of the weights apart from the first were fixed for that particular study. So then we optimized the first weight and we were able to get the uh, objective function down to 1.1 uh, millimeters squared. Of course, now we don't actually have a measure of what the error in the low-free geometry is because we don't actually know what that is. Uh, but you can see here that the eccentricity is still quite high. It is still much more sensitive to the stiffness parameter. However, the de-optimality number has jumped significantly from previously. And we think that this is because when we're using actual data, the amount of displacement between the diastasis model and the end diastolic model is much larger. And so we have uh, more identifiability to be playing with. And so um, just in conclusion, we also looked at the correlation between the changes that we see in the stiffness parameter uh, from uh, estimating low-free geometry and not estimating low-free geometry, uh, and the correlation of that with things such as the, the size of the ventricle, so this is the diastasis volume, and the old stiffness value, so the stiffness value without including low-free geometry. And so uh, there is a possible trend of a larger change in the stiffness value if you had a larger stiffness value to begin with. And so basically this means that if you're trying to estimate a heart which is very stiff, then you are going to overestimate the stiffness a lot if you don't include the low free geometry estimation, which is what we expected uh, from the beginning. So. <laughs> very fast. Um, let me just quickly go over. We have just demonstrated, um, attempted to demonstrate the feasibility of using this PCA to evaluate the load free geometry and also simultaneously estimate the stiffness parameter. We apply this framework to clinical data and we show that the importance of including the load free geometry estimation for the estimation of myocardial stiffness is especially important for larger and stiffer hearts. So here are the aims that we began with in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, and here are my acknowledgments to my supervisors and my advisory committee and um, the people who have helped me out in various parts of my PhD and also our clinical collaborators uh, from New York who are able to provide us with this very uh, valuable clinical data. And of course, all the awesome people on Level 7. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask the first question, and it's actually of you guys. Can Jenny, can you just stand here a second? So, um, <laughs> this, is a, this is an amazing time for us as supervisors because we get to celebrate the completion, almost, slightly premature, of, uh, of an amazing amount of work that you've just heard a little bit about. So, over to you to ask some questions for Jenny. Hi. So, um, I'm sorry if I missed in your talk, but. Um, the difference between the load free geometry and the end diastolic, is that accounted for by contraction of the atria? Sorry. Uh, is, that, is that from the pressure of the atria? Right, um, yes. Yep. So the diastolic filling is in two phases. The first phase, the atria does not contract. It's, it, the blood flows in purely by pressure difference. And then, yep, the second portion from the diastasis geometry to the end diastole, it is by atrial contraction. Right. Yep. Going right back to your first section, yep. and you were showing the differences between using the DTI measured fiber mm. and the dog heart data. Why do you right. think the um, dog heart data would be better at modeling a human heart than mm. measured human? Oh, sorry, so that wasn't me measured human DTI, it was also measured canine DTI as well. Oh, so they were actually okay. both dog heart. Um, but yeah, and I think maybe the reason why the Auckland dog heart did better was just that it had higher resolution, potentially, uh, near the endocardium and the epicardium, so you were able to see a greater sort of change in myocardial, in myofiber orientation than you were able to see in DTI. Oh, that was my bloody question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Uh, I learned something else during this talk today as well, is how to spell Prasad's third name. Yes, I was going <laughs> to say... I've seen that on a presentation. Yes, Prasad, yes. What was your question? Yes, that used to be my last name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Jenny, I was just wondering, so you looked at 
pressure as the main uh, reason why the heart is initially in a loaded state. Right. How about uh, residual stresses in the war, and is there any evidence that the mm. residual stresses are different between individuals? Yeah, so I wasn't able to look at that um, in this in this study, um, simply because you would probably need a lot of experimental data to be able to do that. Um, there is literature out there that you know think about whether uh, the inflation of the heart um, during diastolic filling has is related to how much residual tension there was in the heart even at the load free state, and whether it sort of um, it was it initially had a positive strain, and then as you inflated, it went to ne to zero strain, and then to to negative strain as well. So there is that. Um, future work, I guess, uh, it, yeah, it was sort of outside the scope of... Yeah, I'm just thinking because, um, like you said, if you do account for the unloaded state, then your stiffness estimates change. Yes. So, yeah, yep. it'd be interesting, I guess, to see how much... Right, to put the residual in there as well and see much, yeah. yeah. But, but not only that, how does it affect your, your ability then to differentiate between different diseases? Right. So comparing, I guess, the unloaded, um, when you have unloaded geometry, Mm. And then looking at the correlation, but also looking at then comparing that to what would happen if you don't take into account the unloaded state. Right, so you're talking about like group comparison stats yeah. before and after, including right. the low free uh, geometry. And the different diseases and see yeah. is the unloaded state really required in, in terms of, so it does mm. change, as you said. It changes the stiffness the parameter stiffness, estimation. How much does it, um, yeah. yeah, is it essential, basically? Mm. Yeah, that's definitely something to look at. Um, going from here. Thanks. Go. Um, I think I missed some part. You have some alpha, beta, and some parameters to be with your, with your uh, hops up file. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they, they are not estimated? Or? Yeah, so they weren't estimated because there were eight parameters and we only had surface data. So I actually took them from the docos, um, from, yeah, it was fitted to the docos show data. Yeah. Um, just a follow-up question. Yeah. So you, you change just the weight for your first PT, and you have mm -hmm. whole other effort and optimal value according to the slide. So so how many other um, how many more modes do you have for the fitting for the patients? How many more modes? So there were twenty eight different patients, and so there were twenty seven uh, principal modes. Not a lot. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you want to vary that? Well, so uh, actually, if you were doing the unloading form of the PCA, then you have 28 times 4 minus 1, which is 112, I think, uh, different principal modes. But it would be really great if, if this could actually tap into some big data um, so that we could you know, just, just have that PCA lying around uh, so that you could always um, yeah, use it straight away for your low tree geometry estimation. So one of, one of the problems uh, that you clearly had was the um, lack of information about mm. the deformation relying yeah. simply on the surface data. endocardial surface data. And the endocardial, so. Oh, and the endocardial, right. Yeah. Do, you have, uh, do you have a feeling for whether the, uh, or how much improvement you might uh, achieve with uh, uh, being able to track material points? Um, using, you know, tagged MRI. Yeah. Mm, I, I no. The the answer is no. I don't really have a feeling for that. But I would assume that it would be a lot more identifiable because then we have actual uh, material point tracking. Although, um, yeah, because I mean the inflation uh, period is the, the deformation is actually quite. Um, radial, uh, it, it's sort of, it is how you expect it to be, whereas I would think that that would be more applicable if you were looking at systolic parameter estimations where you wanted to see, you know, torsion and that kind of stuff, and that is completely not captured by the surface data. Um, I think what would actually help more is if you could extend the diastolic phase, if you could, for example, overload a patient <laughs> um, to, to drive them further up the pressure volume curve to see more deformation that way, and that could improve your stiffness estimation more, I would think, than if you had internal deformation data points. It is something that could be checked by a purely 
model-based analysis. That is true, yeah. That's true. Before Friday, before you leave? <laughs> well, I'm just wondering why your supervisor didn't... Uh, <laughs> 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 yes. I, I got the impression throughout the early part of your presentation that mm. you were going to wind up telling us that some of the classifications that had been done in New York mm. were incorrect. Mm. Uh, that was not the case. So you, you stuck with those classifications yeah. just because... Uh, clinicians are gods, or <laughs> no, not at all. Um, yeah, I think I was, you I was can't trying. Your <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was trying to head towards that direction as well with this graph here, where I wasn't plotting uh, the results just in terms of box plots of three different categories, but I was. This is actually ordered according to the, the magnitude of the stiffness, and I think. W it would be good to head towards this direction instead of you know using the ejection fraction to classify them, but the thing is, I guess, um, yeah, it's it, it's really. Uh, <laughs> I would like to say that you know the the ejection fraction is not good enough. We need to throw it away. We need to adopt the stiffness thing. But you can see that there is a lot that still needs to be done in order for us to have greater confidence in the stiffness but estimations. The control value there at about a value of fifteen somewhere. Oh yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, look at that one and look at this one. Yeah, so what, what does that say about the classification? Sorry, this is, uh, so this is patient number 15. Um, the actual stiffness value is, a, is about right. three points, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't you say, though, that the uh, yeah. treatment between the preserved or the reduced yeah. was different? And they, with the reduced treatment on the preserved, it didn't, didn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there seems that the treatment is matching the classification. Um, right. The treatment is matching the classification because the, the HEF-PEF is a mixed bag. So it's, it's sort of diagnosed by exclusion. So if you've got heart failure symptoms and you've got ejection fraction, which is weirdly not below 50, then you're in that class. But they're not quite sure what is actually the, the phenotype that's actually going wrong there in terms of the stiffness. Um, and I guess it could be that you know, the way that we have grouped these patients into these groups has singled out a particular phenotype within the HEF-PEF group that seems to have very similar stiffnesses, but it doesn't mean that that's what happens for the entire HEF-PEF group. And actually, I mean, the advantage of this is that you can do this on a personalized basis, right? So you, you don't have to rely on saying, uh, you know, you're a HEF-PEF person, therefore I'm going to treat you in this particular way. So. Oh, Not sure of that. Are the patients um, being medicated um, in, um, during the start of the station? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think so. So the the clinical stuff, the reports that I'm getting, they have this is the diagnostic uh, phase of, of the clinical process. Yeah, they are being treated for hypertension, though. A lot of them are. Yeah. Richard, did you have one? Oh yeah, I, I just um, was wondering. Um, I just wanted you to confirm that, mm. that you're trying to get a, um, a per unit volume stiffness of this material um, because um, the HIF, HIF once mm. had a very thick myocardium in, in your illustration. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there might be sort of mutual reinforcement type um, things happening because you have a much thicker body that. that but the thickness of that heart is accounted for in my mechanical simulation. So, so the models are the same shape as the patient's heart. So if, um, yeah, if it was a purely sort of geometric effect that's, that's causing, yeah, you know. I just wanted to know that that yeah. was um, I, I, I wouldn't think of it as per volume, stiffness per volume. I would think of it as the stiffness of the entire uh, cardiac tissue that is consistent with the deformation that you see and the pressure that you observe. So, yeah, it is a homogenous stiffness which we're estimating, I guess. That, yeah. Right, we've got the last question. I think Paul had his hand up. Sorry, Chris, we're going to, you can ask any answer. Paul, what's your, well, we always reserve the final question for you. So. Yeah, actually, this isn't the question. I was just oh. going to say <laughs> that um, oh, it's I, thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be nice to have finished the seminar off with a violin with Oh, <laughs> yeah. If I knew Martin was going to mention it, I would have brought my violin. <laughs> and that's full performance. I would like to congratulate you. And thank, thank you for the last...